And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, our God is speaking right now, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my men servants and my maid servants, this is God speaking, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. Oh, can't you feel it? Heaven is reaching. God's reaching down. Is there anyone that I can show myself strong on this morning? Is there anyone that would hear my voice? Is there anyone that would hear my voice and not harden their hearts? And say, today is the day. I want more of you, God. I want to be filled with your spirit, God. Don't get funny about it. It's just being filled with everything that God is so that you can do everything that God called you to do, and I can too. It's as simple as that. Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them who ask? This is a great song to ask, church. This is a great song to get connected to grab the hand of God that's reaching down from heaven with his grace and his mercy and his truth. You know, the spirit is called the spirit of grace. Divine influence on the heart. Thank you, Lord. Fall afresh on us in your house this morning, God, I pray. Have your way.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your presence, God. We love Jesus. We've been talking in the book of the Revelation about the last days. And this book was written to give the church an understanding of what was going to happen in the last days with regards to God finally putting a wrap on uh, the plan of salvation and the, um, the uh, tyranny of sin and wickedness and that he was going to bring it all under wraps with a judgment. Now, something that we are going to see this morning is, even in his judgment, God is being merciful. He's being gracious because it will be through the tumultuous times that we live in that God draws people to himself. You and I have to come to terms with this fact that, generally speaking, our lives do not improve until they run up against some obstacle. Uh, you usually don't start paying attention to your health until you start to lose it in some fashion. You usually don't pay too much attention to retirement until you start getting a little bit older and go, oh, that's what they were talking about. And, and, you, and you realize you're going to be a few dollars short. You're going to have to work a few extra years. Uh, when you want to go and compete in sports, that you've got to go through a breaking down process before you enter into the building up process. And so all, all growth, both spiritual and natural, both emotional and mental, takes some work and some trials and some suffering. And so God uses trials and sufferings and even judgment to, to bring people to himself. Because here's the deal. As long as nothing changes and we feel like everything's going on well, no one really pays attention to God himself or the things of God. So God shakes, the scripture tells us in Hebrews, that God shakes heaven and earth so that the things that can be shaken fall away and the things that cannot be shaken remain. And so that's what's going on. I just want to encourage us with that. To, and, and we're going to see this morning that it's not happenstance, that it's all according to a plan. So let's go to Revelation chapter 4. And let's, it's only 11 verses, and it's kind of unfair really to read four without five because uh, four and five are set in the throne room. I will tell you that chapter four focuses on God the Father as creator, and chapter five focuses on God the Son as the Redeemer, but uh, we're just going to talk about chapter four this morning. So let's begin reading verse one. After these things I looked, and behold... A door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which will must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed with white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. 
The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever, who lives forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist. Let's pray. Lord, we just ask you now, God, come and help us to understand your word. Help us to find hope, joy, and peace in these scriptures. And to know that, Father God, even in your righteous and holy judgment, you are merciful, calling people to yourself that they might find hope, forgiveness, redemption, cleansing, healing, and joy from Jesus Christ and him alone. We pray in his name. Amen. Now, I want you to back up to Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. This is the outline for the entire book of the Revelation. We've taught on, on it before when we talked about the rapture, but here's what it says. This is Jesus speaking. John is having an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. Jesus has shown himself to John and has told him that he's going to dictate to him a letter, that he wants John to write it and to send it to the churches. And so... Uh, the scripture tells us in John chapter 1, verse 19, this is what Jesus said. Write the things which you have seen, have seen, past tense, and the things which are, present tense, and the things which will take place after this, future tense. So what we have here is a three-part breakdown. The first part, the things which you have seen, regards chapter 1, the vision that, God, that John has had of Jesus uh, the thing now and then he says the things which are that's chapters 2 and 3 that's the letters to the churches as they exist upon the earth we finished that up last week and he said and then the things which will take place after this meaning after the things which are so the things that are is the church on the earth and he had a letter of commendation and a letter of correction to each one of those then he said, after this, in the Greek, the, the phrase after this is metatauta, metatauta. Now, that's important because when we go to chapter 4, verse 1, that we just read, it says, after these things. That's the same phrase, metatauta. So what you're getting ready to see, and then it goes down, and the last sentence says, which must take place after this, metatauta. So the same phrase that's used for the future tense in chapter 1, verse 19, is being spoken two times in the same verse of chapter 4, verse 1, meaning that the future event that J Jesus was talking about in chapter 1, verse 19, are now going to be displayed to John so that John could see in real time what was going to happen in the future does everybody follow that okay so you have the vision of christ you have the churches and then the things that shall happen after this now all of this is a setup i want to draw your attention back to chapter one once more just for a second and i want to look at chapter one verse one verse three and verse seven verse one the revelation of jesus christ what is he talking about the return and the unveiling of Jesus. Now, John has already met Jesus. He was a disciple of Jesus. John has already seen the resurrected Jesus. So it's not talking about the historical Jesus. It's not even talking about the resurrected Jesus. When he talks about the revelation of Jesus, he's talking about the revelation of the victorious Christ coming back to the earth. And that's what the book of Revelation is. And what we're getting ready to read with all of these judgments and everything that's going to happen is a prelude, is a setup for the return of Jesus. Look at 
Verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Meaning the time of what? The time of the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's near. Verse 7. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. So, the time is drawing near for Christ to return, and we are supposed to be preparing ourselves for his return, and he's showing us the things that are going to to happen on the earth with regards to the setup for his return. The things which take place after this, after the church age. Now, John hears a voice in chapter 4, verse 1, and he says, the first voice which I heard saying, come up here, and it tells him that he sees, he sees, he hears a voice, and he sees an open door. He sees an open door, he hears a voice that says, come up. Now, this is a picture, I want you to stay with me here. This is a picture of the rapture of the church that is to happen in the future. This is not the rapture. This is John being caught up into heaven. This is John going up so that he can see. But we can draw parallels between what happened to John and what will happen to the church. You see, it prefigures. He says that he sees what? A door standing open in heaven. Well, if you'll look back in your Bible to chapter 3, verse 8, as Jesus was talking to the church at Philadelphia, he says, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door. You go, well, what? That's a big deal. Open door for that church. What does that mean? We talked about that open door, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. What is he talking about? Well, let me tell you what he's talking about. Just look down at verse 10 in chapter 3, and it bring, makes it clear. Jesus speaking to the church at Philadelphia. Because you have kept my command to persevere. That means to keep the faith through thick and thin. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now, how can you keep believers in a church, how can you keep them from, from the hour of trial which is going to come to the whole earth? The answer is, you take them off the earth. The question is, is that they go through the open door. And the open door is the open door of heaven, chapter 4, verse 1. That John was in the spirit, and God is showing him spiritual truths. You couldn't see them with these eyes, but there's an open door in heaven. And a voice comes out of heaven and tells John, come up here. Come up here. Now, Two times in the book of the Revelation, you're going to see an open door in heaven. One is, we just read it right here in chapter 4, verse 1. There's an open door, and John goes in. In Revelation chapter 19, there's another open door. But this time, nobody goes in, but somebody comes out. And who's coming out is Jesus Christ, riding a white horse. That's a figure, that's a figure of speech, meaning he's coming triumphantly. They don't have horses in heaven. I know that disappoints some people, all right? But. And so he's riding a horse, and it says, and all of his saints with him. So the second open door in the book of the Revelation, Revelation 19, Jesus comes back, and we all come with him back to the earth. And you say, well, this is, this is, uh, this is too much for me, Pastor Randy. You, you've gone past my ability to understand, and, and, and I'm, I'm cool with Jesus. Uh, but I, I'm not cool with all this, so, so let me get this straight. You believe that Jesus was virgin born. 
that he was completely God and completely man, that he was killed on a cross, that he was buried in a grave, and that he got up out of the grave by himself without anybody opening up the tomb. You're good with that, but you can't get this. Come on. Somebody that gets up from the dead can do anything they want to do, right? Somebody that rules and reigns over the earth can do what they want to do, right? And so, he's, so he's, he tells John, he says, come up. And, there's, and you say, well, this is a, that's a little far-fetched. Well, it, it would be if there had not been some examples in the Scripture. If you know that before the great flood of Noah, that there was a man called Enoch. And the Scripture says that Enoch walked with God. And the Bible says that God took him up. He was and he was not, for God took him. In other words, Enoch never died. Enoch was walking here, and the next thing you know, he was there. And then the flood came. But then the people that were on the earth, that is Noah and his wife and their six, their three sons and their three wives, eight people on the earth, were the only people that were spared the judgment of God. Noah had been preaching for, for uh, years and years and years while he built the ark, and no one responded to the call of salvation. And the Bible says that God told Noah, get in the ark. And that ark is a picture or a form of Christ in the Old Testament, showing us that it's in Christ that we avert the judgment. And before the floods came, the Bible says that Noah and all of the animals went into the ark. And here's what it says, and God closed the, the door. See, God closed the door. And then judgment came in the form of a flood. And who's the only people that survived? Noah. We have an example now of, that's an example of, of uh, escaping judgment. Uh, we have a picture of uh, Elijah being caught up in a chariot in a whirlwind. Uh, and Elisha saw him go into heaven and his, and his, his uh, robe fell back. And, and Noah picked, I mean, and uh, Elisha picked it up and took the anointing of Elijah and went forth and preached the gospel. And so we have the, the, the catching up there. We have the catching up of uh, Jesus. The scripture says that after he went out to the mountain, after his uh, meeting with the disciples, that uh, he spoke to them and said, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high, for you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the othermost parts of the earth. And the Bible says, and while they gazed, he ascended into heaven and disappeared among the clouds. And the angels came and said, you men of Galilee, why stand you staring up into heaven? This same Jesus who has gone away from you shall so come again in like manner as you saw him leave. So, and so my point is, is that Jesus ascended. Uh, when Stephen was stoned, the scripture says that he was in the earth and he closed his eyes and he was in the heavens. Paul said, uh, whether it was in the body or not, I'd have no idea, but I was caught up unto the third heaven and I was able to see things that God would not let me speak. And even in the book of the Revelation, later in Revelation chapter 11, we're going to see two witnesses who ascend into heaven. So don't let the ascension into heaven, don't let the idea of being here and then being there uh, mess you up. There's, there's a pretext for that. There's, there's precedent for that. And, 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 and that is going to happen to you and I. Listen, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, when God gets ready to execute the wrath on the earth, you're going to hear the voice of God like a trumpet. And the door of heaven is going to be open. And just like Jesus, and just like Elijah, and just like Enoch, just like Stephen, and just like the two witnesses, you and I are going to be gone in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Going up to be with Jesus. There's semblances of John's ascension and the rapture of the church. In verse four, 1, he says, I heard a voice. The voice that I heard, the first voice that I heard, what was the first voice that he heard? Back in chapter 1, it says, I heard behind me a voice. Let me just flip over there so you guys don't think I'm misquoting this. Uh, chapter 1, verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, 
It was Jesus who was the voice that sounded like a trumpet called John into heaven to see the heavenly things that must be the setup for the coming judgment. And likewise, in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, if we could put that up, talking about the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. Do you have that one, Shannon? I didn't highlight it, so you probably didn't get it. It says, the Lord himself would descend, there you go, from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. See, the same way that happened to John in chapter 4 of Revelation going up to heaven is the same thing that Paul was talking to the church at Thessalonica was going to happen to them. Let's look at something else in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. I want you to read this now, guys, because you have to read the book of the Revelation in the context of these verses. If you don't, you're going to be lost. But concerning the times and the seasons, what is he talking about? The return of Christ and us going to meet with him. Let's watch it. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, now notice this, Paul is writing, and he's going to talk about the people who are going to enter into judgment as they, and the people that are going to miss judgment as we. Watch. For when, when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, contrast, see the word but, but you, meaning that what you're getting ready to read about these people is different from the people you just read about. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let not sleep as others do, but let watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint, I'm going to say it again, for God did not appoint to wrath. Well, if it's not us, who is it? Them. Who is them? Unbelievers. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for that whether wake or sleep should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you are also doing. See, you shouldn't read. If you're a believer, you shouldn't read the book of the Revelation and get scared. You ought to get happy. You ought to get, ooh, Lord, have mercy. Now, if you're lost, you need to sweat. Because without Christ, if you're not already in hell through death, you're fixing to kiss it wide open. All right, now, so, so John hears a tr voice like a trumpet, an open door, and he comes up. And the reason that we believe that this is analogous to the rapture of the church is because from chapter 1 to chapter 4, or actually chapter 3 in the book of the Revelation, the word church is used 19 times. After chapter 3 to the end of the book, it's used zero times. That everything that God has to say to the church and about the church happens in the first three chapters. Beginning with chapter 4, with the invitation to go through the open door, you don't hear any more reference to the church. Therefore, we believe that the church has been taken from the earth and gone into heaven through the open door, just like John did in his vision. And we believe that the church will be looking down. So it's not ironic that the rest of the events that take place in the book of the Revelation are from a heaven view looking down, not an earthly view looking up. And so the dispensation changes now. I want you, do you have Romans eleven twenty five? 25? So here's what's going to happen after the rapture and preceding the seven years of tribulation. God's entire plan shifts from one group of people to another group of people. 
And this is what it is. For I do not desire, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant. Ignorant means uninformed. It doesn't mean stupid. It means uninformed. I do not desire, brethren, brethren, he's talking to fellow believers, that you should be uninformed of this mystery. Mystery because it's just now being disclosed in the New Testament what had been hidden in the Old Testament. Lest you should be wise in your own opinion. In other words, think you got it all figured out. That blindness, that's talking about spiritual blindness, in part has happened to Israel. Now, guys, when it says Israel there, he's talking about a nation of people. And what's happening right now in the world is that the focus of God with regard to evangelism and soul saving is upon what we call the Gentiles. The Gentiles in the Bible was a, a name for all the people that weren't Jews. When the Jews rejected Christ, God turned from the Jews towards the nations, the Gentile nations. And the focus of salvation is now towards non-Jewish people. Are Jewish people being saved? Yes, but a minute trickle. After the Gentile church, that's me and you, the church of the nations is raptured up and taken up. God's now going to turn his attention back to a nation of people. And he's going to work with them just as he's been working with the Gentiles through all this era of time. So let's begin it again. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, that you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to the nation of Israel until... The fullness of the Gentiles has come in, meaning the fullness of God's salvation of the Gentiles. And so, all Israel, that's the nation of Israel, will be saved. As it is written, the Deliverer, that's Jesus, will come out of Zion, that's heaven, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Jacob is the name that God gave, was the uh, name that God changed to Israel. All right, verse 26. Was that 25 and 26? Okay. The deliverer will come out of Israel and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So the, the whole crux of the, of the tribulation, okay, is judgment upon the Gentile nations who have rejected Christ and through their judgment to bring the Jews to faith. Does that make sense? He's going to bring the Jews to faith. Now, I'm just I'm not gonna I'm not gonna preach on this, but let me tell you how he's gonna do that. Are you ready? Just really quick, let me just throw this in. It's not even in my notes. God is going to start a war in Israel, in the valley of Jeshua. You can look, that's in the northern part of Israel. And he's going to summon the nations, meaning that all of the nations of the earth are going to be gathered to battle. And God's going to destroy them for what they've done to the nation of Israel. I had a guy that's a believer, says he's a believer. So help me God, what I'm telling you with the, my hand up is the truth. He's been talking about Jesus for all these years. I've been knowing him for years and years and years. We were at the gym. I was on the treadmill. And he always comes and shares with me some things. And here's what he said. He said, I've been listening to some smart people and and this and that, and I'm going to go into all that he said. And he said, well, let me tell you something. He said, they are beginning to be irritated with the Jewish people. And he said, and I can understand that. Now, this is coming from a Christian. He said, I can understand that. Let me tell you something, guys. This, 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 this is just a FYI for you. When you line up, on the opposite side of where Israel stands, you're on the losing team. That ain't going to go good. And just like the teaching of the rapture that I'm giving to you today is being attacked and is diminishing from the pulpit, so also at the same time the rise of anti-Semitism, that is a hatred against the Jewish people, is arising inside the walls of the church 
Satan is at work with a false gospel. Going to catch the world, going to catch the church asleep and hateful of the Jews. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. Changes in the church are not for good. Anything that's changing inside the church is not for good. The, far, the more we change, the farther we get away from how things were. And that's not a good thing. I'm not going to go into all that, but I'm just telling you that, that the instigator of the teaching against the rapture and the instigator of the teaching against the Jews is happening simultaneously in the church. And people who are not rooted and grounded in the word of God and rooted and grounded in the truth are falling prey to it. And you're getting comfortable and laid back and you want the Jews to be annihilated. And let me tell you something. When hell breaks out, it's coming on everybody. All right? So, let me go on down. Here's what the focus of all of heaven is. I'm going to kind of scoot past my notes here because I don't want to keep you guys too long. But when John gets into the when John gets into the heavens, into heaven, he sees a throne. And the whole of heaven is throne center. Everything else is about the throne. For the next 12, I mean 11 verses, he uses the word throne 12 times in 11 verses. It's all about the throne. Now I don't want to mess up anybody's parade. I don't want anybody to get mad at me that's read these books, that's watched these YouTube videos, that's gone to the movies where people have gone into heaven and they've seen horses and they've seen grass and they've seen waterfalls and they've seen pawpaw and meemaw and brothers and aunts and uncles. They have seen everything but a throne. I'm just telling you that the eyewitness account of the man who went personally at the invitation of Jesus when he stepped through the doorway, he said, throne, 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 throne. I would just dare to say that anybody's book, video, or movie that doesn't have a throne in it didn't get too far in to heaven. And the one sitting on it was described as a bright light. God is described not in his form, but in his brightness. Why? Because the scripture tells us in 1 Timothy 6 that God dwells in unapproachable light. And that his light was as a jasper. That's the word we have for diamond. It was clear. It, it relates to God's uh, holiness. And that's what all of the... Uh, angelic beings, the cherubim are flying back and forth going, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. His second light that emanates from him is sardius, which is a deep red, which speaks of, which speaks of judgment and wrath and justice. Not ironically that the sardius, I mean that the jasper stone, the diamond, and the sardius stone, the red one, were the first and the last stones that were on the uh, the, of the 12 stones that were on the ephod of the high priest, which represented the firstborn son of Jacob and the lastborn son of Jacob. And that God would bear the identification of his people upon his breastplate. And what came out of the throne was a, a blinding light, clear and red. And he sat on the throne. And then around the throne, it says, was a rainbow. Emerald in color, which means it was green. Now we know that the rainbow first appeared in the book of Genesis when God destroyed heaven and earth. Then he comes to Noah and he said, Noah, I'm going to make a covenant with you. The, the rainbow is the sign of a covenant. Now when you and I see a rainbow, we see an end and an end. And it looks like an arc. But when you look at it from heaven, a rainbow is never an arc with a beginning and an end. A rainbow is a circle. With no beginning and no end. Meaning that God, the God who sits on the throne, is a God who keeps his word. There's no beginning and no end. And that even in his righteous judgment in which he's getting ready to visit the earth with, he's still remembering his mercy. You see, on a throne, God has the right. And that's what 
chapter 4 is about is that the one who sits on the throne is the creator of all things and as the creator of all things he has the right to do whatever he wants to with his creation and men today sit on the earth and shake our fists at heaven in our ignorance and in our pride saying you have no right to do this who says you could do this why are you doing this you shouldn't be doing this you're an unholy you're an unrighteous god to which god laughs because the fist that they're shaking and the voice that they're speaking is the very fist that God gave them and the breath that God allows them to have. God can do what he wants to. He's sitting on the throne. President Biden is not sitting on the throne, to which I would like to just take a pause and go, hallelujah. I like to go full-fledged Medea. Thank God that man ain't sitting on the throne. I'd hate to lose heaven. It's a joke. Y'all will get it later. God's on the throne. God's running the show. Not Iran. Not Xing Ping, Ling, Ting Wing. Whatever his name is over in China. He ain't running it. Stubby leg, flat top over there in, in uh, North Korea. He ain't running it. Mr. KGB over in Russia, he ain't running it. The one that's running the show is the king of the universe. The one who created all things. And by his will, they exist. And he's working all things toward a, a predetermined end. Nobody's, God is not watching CNN, thank God. He's not reading the paper. He's not taking Tagamet, and he's not taking a shot of whiskey before bed so he can get a wink. God's not broke up, tore up from the floor up. God is ruling and reigning, sovereign over all things. And as the creator God, and as the one who sits on the throne, he has the right and the authority to do just exactly what he wants to do. But as the one whose throne is circled by covenant rainbow, he has limited himself to keep his word and his promises to his people. And even in his wrath he remembers mercy out from the throne comes lightnings and thunderings and voices in verse 5 that means that there's a storm coming look at Job 36 32 and 33 if you would Shannon he covers his hands with lightning and commands it to strike his thunder declares it the cattle also concerning the rising storm oh my God it's got this is got to become attentive I should have known this but I didn't I went to Montana I don't know if y'all saw the post that we put up with the wind blowing in Montana it was so it was blowing so hard that they couldn't even hear the video voice of the video I was but Bruce said Randy you know the direction that the wind is coming from you can always tell the direction the wind's coming from I'm going how he said the animals will turn their tails toward it They'll always have their head away from the wind. And guys, listen to me now. That's what's happening in the earth today. There's a storm rising. And no one wants to look into the storm. Because it's ominous. The whole world, even in the church, is doing this. They think that by turning away from it, not looking at it, doing this and doing this, that it's going to go away. It's coming. What you and I need to be ready for is an open door and a voice like a trumpet that says, come up here. I'm getting out of here. And we need to tell people, stop turning away from the storm. Turn into it and receive the salvation of God. God is not bringing this to destroy man he could do that like that it wouldn't have to be any drama he's doing this in incremental stages so that it builds and builds and builds so that hard-headed people would turn I remember hearing a, a convict one time he was a comedian and he said my wife left me and I said baby why are you leaving me she said you got a drug and alcohol problem he said I don't have a drug and alcohol problem she said yes you do and one of these days it's gonna dawn on you that you have a drug and alcohol problem 
He said, so she left me. And he said, one day I was out riding around having a few drinks, and I rode past my house. He wasn't living there anymore. He said, I drove past my house, and he said, there was a strange car in my driveway. And I got out and looked through the window, and there was a strange man sitting on my couch with my wife. And I got mad. So I went and got me some gas, and I set the house on fire with them in it. Now, of course, they got out, but the house burned up. And he said, and I got convicted for arson, and I sobered up in the Texas State Penitentiary, and it dawned on me I had a drug and alcohol problem. God's judgments are to bring us to an aha moment. We need a Savior. Because your rescue net has a hole in it the size of your soul. And everything that you put your faith in is going to let you down and leave you alone with eternity without God. And that's why God is going to visit this earth. It says around the throne were 24 elders. Who are the elders? Well, let me just go on to say, first of all, without going to all the scriptures, that they are clothed in white. We find out in other scriptures that the white clothing is the righteousness of the saints. That they all have on a, a crown on their head. It's the Stephanos, that's in a Greek word, the Stephanos or Stephanos uh, crown. That's the cloud of overcoming. To the church of Sardis, Jesus promised to him who overcomes, I will give the crown. Then it goes down and we know, we didn't read this in verse because we didn't read chapter 5, but we know that they're saints because they sing a song of redemption. In chapter 5, verse 9, it says, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. We know that these 24 elders are saints because of how they're, what they're wearing. We know that they're saints because of what they have on their head. We know that they're saints because they, of the song of redemption that they sing. And we know uh, that there were 24 courses of, of priests to God in the Old Testament. When David got ready to set up, the, I mean, uh, Moses got ready to set up the priesthood, God instructed that there would be 24 courses or divisions. So these divisions of priests seated in heaven Reveal to us that these are the saints. And they begin to cry out, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. And whenever the living creatures, we didn't talk about them, but they are the cherubim. Uh, Ezekiel saw them in chapter 1 of his book. Isaiah saw them in chapter 6 of his book. You can find out more about them there. They circle the throne and they cry out, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, meaning the all-powerful, all-wise, sovereign one who was and is and is to come. Verse 11, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist. In other words, they're circling the throne. Come on, Sean. Crying out, holy, holy, holy. And that you are worthy because you're the creator. And what's about to happen, you have the right and the authority to do it. Because God is the creator of all things. We'll go to chapter 5 next week. And Jesus is the redeemer of all things. They have the absolute right and the authority to execute judgment on the earth. 